please stand? We're going to worship. Good morning, everyone. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Me, I am who you say I 
place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Father, we are so grateful that we can come together this morning to worship you, that we can come to hear your word. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open. I pray, Lord, that your joy and your peace would descend into this place this morning. In your precious name. church there we are we're awake well uh, spiritual formation you know I am just overjoyed that pastor Devin is going to be preaching on the Lord's Prayer because our spiritual journey our walk with God everything absolutely everything begins with prayer this morning um, I want to talk about humility. You know, when we say the Lord's Prayer, it begins with a position of humility because we are recognizing a God in heaven, a greater God. We are recognizing that we are not unto ourselves, we are not it. But God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are the preeminence in our lives or should be. 
our spiritual journey, it uh, begins with surrender, the surrendering of self, a bowing down and taking on positions of humility. It's recognizing that everything we have, absolutely everything we need, is from our Father in Heaven. Out of humility, growth happens. That's where it happens. That's where our journey takes on a different meaning. It takes on a growth in our, our spiritualness, a growth in our recognizing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a growth in recognizing that there's a lot of things that I need to lay down, that I need to surrender, that I need to give up. It's a mindset, and it becomes our mindset becomes God-focused instead of me-focused. You know, um, I'm speaking on prayer. I, I know, because I'm right there in the camp as well, there's things in our lives that we have prayed for years and years and years. There's dreams that we've had and we've, we've harbored them for years and years and years. There's hopes and desires, and all these things have been unanswered. We think that, you know, God didn't hear me. But there is no prayer. There is no kindness. There is no sacrifice that God didn't hear and that God will not answer. Everything, absolutely everything, comes to fulfillment in due season. Every prayer that you have prayed that is not answered yet, maybe the seeds that you have sown that haven't borne a harvest yet, the dreams that you have buried and haven't, they haven't risen up yet. God will restore the years. God will restore the, the prayers and the trust that the years of locusts have eaten. There's a Jesuit prayer of humility, which I find is absolutely priceless. And it brings us into a place of recognizing what needs to be let go in our lives. It, it brings us into a place of knowing that the meanness, the selfishness, needs to be surrendered and it's time to bow down. And so I'm going to share that this morning. And I'd like you to just center your heart upon what God wants to speak to you th this morning through this Jesuit prayer. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, O oh Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, O oh Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, O oh Jesus. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I decrease, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That was just one little portion of this Jesuit prayer. Something that really through the years has stuck with me and kept me grounded in a place so that I can hear God. It's not just about me or you coming before the Lord with a whole list of needs and wants and desires. It is about being quiet and in the presence of Jesus so that you can hear him. Whether you walk out in nature, you go for your hiking, whatever. Do you enter it by saying, God, I'm walking, I want to hear you, and let him speak to you. That's part of spiritual formation, and that's what I encourage you all to do. Whatever your task may be, enter into the presence of God. Father, 
um, we thank you for how you speak to us, and you speak to us in so many ways. You speak to us through the, the words of another person. You speak to us through songs that we sing, the words of the songs. You speak to us in moments when we are grieving, when we're hurting, when we're broken. You speak to us in moments when we're overfilled with joy. You speak to us in the words of a book. You speak to us out of scripture that you wrote. You speak to us in the silence and in the loudness of life. Thank you, God, for all of it. Thank you for never, ever giving up on any one of us, but for always, always chasing after us. Always chasing after us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Before we enter into praise and prayer, I'm going to ask Karina to come, then I'll pray for the offering as she passes the plates. Lord, you bless us in so many ways. And each Sunday, or whether we give here or whether we give online, we have an opportunity to give out of the abundance you have given to us. And so, Lord, I ask that you would bless the offering, that you would use it and designate it for the purposes that you have designed for your kingdom. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up, buddy. So, praise and prayer.
Pastor Dave asked me to uh, come up and do um, what's typically the announcements, but he, in his texts, called them annulments, but I think I'll do the announcements <laughs> instead. Um, we're going to uh, have the Ladies' Bible Study, which will resume on Monday. Um, and our next announcement is the Youth Night, which is April 20th, um, 7 to 9. And I believe the next one is Soup Sunday on April 28th. Um, and then the last one is the Business Lunch, which is April 24th. So if anyone has any questions about those, you can see me afterwards, um, and I can point you in the right direction. And my next job was to bless the kids, to go off to Sunday school. So may I ask all the kids to come up who want to uh, head off to Sunday school. Is there any children that would like to go to Sunday school? Yay! Ooh, so good. Lord, I just thank you for each and every child here today. I thank you for the gifts that they are to us. I thank you for the pleasure that we get seeing them learn about you. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for them. Thank you for um, what it is that they are about to learn about you. Uh, please be with Megan as she delivers your words through the lesson. And um, I also ask a special blessing on all the children at Racecourse that we partner with through Hands at Work. Please be with the caregivers, uh, help them lead the children, and bless each and every child that uh, comes to Racecourse. Thank you, Lord, for all of this. We just... Um, ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. And my next job is to say please uh, meet and greet and chat for a few minutes and then I can come back and, and resume us. So enjoy, fill up your coffee, and we'll chat in a moment.
Jane, and as always, uh, just a, a huge privilege for me to stand up here and to you know, share with you what God's put on my heart for us uh, here this morning. And I'm particularly excited to speak about or to launch us into our new, new uh, series uh, on prayer, working through the, uh, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. You know, when I think about prayer... I've told this story many times. My wife will probably zone out pretty soon. But uh, when I think about prayer, I'm always reminded of a story of when we just moved over to, to Canada. So when we came over three years ago, I came over as a, uh, as a pastor or a theologian. So I worked for a church down in Vancouver. And my job was to preach and teach and kind of compile the uh, theological material for the churches and the different congregations down there. And not long after arriving, we had some friends over to our place to have a meal. And, uh, and that particular night, like many nights before, when people found out what my job was, inevitably I was the one asked to pray for the food. Right? It always happened. And so in the one that this particular night again, the friends stood up, they found out what I did for a living, and they said, well, would you mind praying for the food? And in that moment, I just caught my wife's eye because... It always happened. Whether it's a family, whether it's a friend, when they found what I do or that I spoke on the Bible and things like that, inevitably I was the one to pray for the food. And by the end of this first year, I considered myself a semi-professional food prayer, I would call myself. But it always happened, and I pondered that, I wondered about that. Like, does God listen to my prayers more than the fellow Christians around the table? Right? And the answer is obviously no. When I think about my kids, I don't listen to one more than the other ones. They're all my children, right? And so it got me thinking about this thing of prayer and how much, how much do we know? It's quite a mystery, it's quite a mysterious thing, this thing called prayer. If we walk back to these, over these last 2,000 years and we managed to get all the, de the denominations in one room and we kind of asked them the question like what are the most fundamental principles or the fundamental practices that we as Christians need to be doing to be disciples of Jesus Christ? Yep, there will be some diff differences, some different opinions, some bias, you know, some, um, some leanings in certain direction. But ultimately, there will be four things, four, over four places of overlap, if you want to call it that, where all of these people will agree that the main things in the Christian life, the main practices that we are to be living into are these four things. It's the Word of God. It's, it's living in the Scriptures and learning and what God has, has given to us in, in the text. That'll be one of the first ones. Uh, one of the other ones would be the sacraments. We're going to have communion here this morning. The sacraments is, you know, communion and, and baptism. Now, again, that, this will look different for different denominations, but ultimately, you know, those are some of the main practices that we as Christians do. The third one, and this one might surprise you, but it's taking care of the poor. This has always been right at the heart of the Christian, of the Christian movement, taking care of the poor. And fourthly, most certainly, will be this thing called prayer. Now, all of these people will say the same thing about prayer. If we are serious about our Christian commitment, if we are serious about going deeper with God and actually being these types of people called Christians, followers of Jesus, then we ought to desire to learn and to grow in this mysterious thing called, called prayer. Now, whether you pray in your bed or next to your bed at night, in your favorite chair next to your fireplace, uh, yeah, in snowy Alberta, whether it's on the train or in your car on the way to work, whatever, wherever it is, whenever it is, one thing is sure, we can all grow, I believe, in this aspect called prayer. And this is why we want to grow. I want to read you a quote from N.T. Wright. He's a, uh, a British theologian. He gets quoted quite often in this church, but... Uh, He's, uh, he's pretty solid, so we can do this. Speaking about this, this thing of, of growing in praise, he said the following, we want, we want all this at our best, not because we selfishly want, as it were, to maximize our own spiritual potential. To think that way would be to import into our Christianity a very modern, materialist, self-centered ideology. In other words, we're not trying to grow in prayer and get better in prayer so that we can become super spiritual, right? Or become just a better version of ourselves and you know and, and things like that he's saying no we want it because we know in our heart of hearts that we want the living God we want to know him we want to love him and we want to be able to truly to call him father 
We want to be able truly to call him Father. That's the heart of prayer. We don't want to get better at this thing so that we can be, you know, look down our noses at those who are not, not too great at prayer. We want to be, get better at this because we know it's about a relationship with God. And so this morning, this is the start of our series. We're going to be walking through the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. And I want to say, regardless of where you are in this prayer journey, whether you are a novice, a beginner, this series is for you. If you're really good at this, um, you know, in advance, and I believe there are some people in this church that are really good at prayer, still this series is for you. Regardless of where you are on this spectrum, whether you've been, you know, whether prayer has been a big part of your life before, but at the moment it's not, wherever you might be, I want to say, just come as you are, and the series is for you. Now, when we speak about prayer, and I know Diane just this morning mentioned a, a, a couple of different types of prayer, and there's so much resources around prayer if you just type it in your phone. You know, I think about yeah, just one of the, the ones that have influenced me, E.M. Bounds, one of the classics, you know, power through prayer, just challenging people to pray, just hours. And so you have that type of material. Then you've got more practical stuff, like Richard Foster in Vancouver. We, we did a, a series just on, on the different types of prayer, and there are more than I can remember. But for our series here at Brad Creek Community Church, we just want to go straight to to what Jesus taught us about prayer. Keep it simple. And that's what we want to try and do. In Luke chapter 11, I'm going to get to the text now. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, I just love this, this particular text. It says that on, on one particular day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And it says, when he finished, his disciples came to him and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, there's so much in that one sentence. It says he was praying, but, but when he had finished, in other words, his disciples were all around. I mean, it must have been quite a thing to watch Jesus pray, right? The King of Glory speaking to his Father. But yet it says when he, when he was finished, at the end, nobody did interrupt Jesus when he was praying. At the end, when he was finished, they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And what is fascinating as you read the Gospels, they never asked him to teach, teach them to walk on water or to, to calm a storm or to transform and be transfigured like he was. But they did ask him to teach them how, how to pray. And that's what we want to do. We want to go to Jesus to learn how to pray. And his words are contained in Matthew chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to read a passage over here. And for the next six weeks or so, we're just going to go deep, verse by verse, into what he has given us. He's given us a model for prayer. So if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to read for us Matthew chapter 6, from verse 5 to 13, but we'll be on the screen behind us too. This is what Jesus said. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we, for, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now what's interesting about this passage is Jesus is going to teach us how to pray. He's going to teach, he's going to teach his, his listeners, the crowds around him. This, is, uh, this passage is contained within the Sermon on the Mount in, in uh, northern Israel next to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is teaching a whole bunch of stuff and now he's moved on, on to prayer. But before he gets to the practicalities of, of giving us the model of how to pray, he starts off with verse 5 and 6 by almost laying a foundation and said, listen, I'm going to teach you how to pray, but before we get to that point, no one thing. This is not a place for hypocrites. To, uh, prayer is not a tool to be used hypocritically. And what is interesting, there's parallels between verse 5 and 6, but also verse 2 and 3, we spoke about giving, right? You'll, re you'll recall if you've read this passage that in, early on in the chapter, he said, Jesus said the words, he said, if you're going to be generous and give, 
do it with the right heart, right? Don't be hypocrites. Don't blow a trumpet before you start giving to get attention, uh, to draw attention to yourselves. So and now in a similar fashion, there's parallels over here. He's saying the same thing. If you're going to be praying, don't do it for the show. Don't do it in public. If you're not doing it in private, is basically what he's saying. And, and this happened. And this happened. He says, when you pray, go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Now, there's no, nothing wrong with play, praying in public. Otherwise, I'd be, I'd be in trouble. Right? And all of our semi-professional food prayers would be in trouble too. But... If that's the extent of our prayer life, then that's a problem. So what he is saying, go into private. That prayer is not something to be used so people can think well of you. Verse 7, he says, When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be, they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. And so he starts off by saying, look, again, there's a certain posture you, 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 you need to have when you when you come into prayer. One is, you know, you're not going to use it for your own advantage so people can think well of you. And now secondly, he's, he's bringing up another point before he gets to the practicality of how we are to pray and gives us the model. And he's saying, in terms of how to pray, don't look to the pagans around us because that is also not the way. So again, it's like a second point he's giving us an introduction before he gives us the practical stuff. He's saying that, and, and this was you know, part of the tradition of the pagan cultures around in that time, is people would do this. They, they would have these uh, um, repetitions, these uh, vain repetitions they would have, nonsensical syllables that they would repeat in these magical types of chants to be heard by their deities. And he says, don't be like these people thinking that the more you blabber and the more things come out of your mouth the, the more likely you are to be heard by God he says no God knows you and God knows what you need even before you ask him one caveat just to lay down with verse 8 he says your father knows what you need before you ask him now, in no way is Jesus saying we should therefore not come and pray because in chapter 7 and in Luke chapter 11 in particular, he speaks about the importance of persistent prayer. So this is, what he's not saying is don't come and pray because your Father knows what you need. What he's saying is don't come babbling thinking that you'll be heard that way. And then we get to the fun part and this is where we'll park for this morning. Verse, verse 9, he says this then, after laying the foundation, and saying, come with the right heart, don't come like the pagans, now let's get down to business. This then is how you should pray. And verse 9, our Father in heaven. What's interesting and quite ironic is he just said, don't come with vain repetitions. In other words, don't think that wo these words are so magical that because of these words you'll be heard by God. You know, coming with babbling and having these rhymes. It's about the heart, right? It's, it's about coming sincerely. But what's ironic is when we look down at, at church history, many, many church traditions have done exactly that with this passage. You know, we've repeated the, the Lord's Prayer quite mechanically, thinking that somehow we will become super spiritual. In fact, if we look down in history, there's, there's some certain traditions where, where the, uh, the Lord's Prayer had to be repeated three times per day. And if you did it three times per day, then you would, you would reach this certain level of spirituality. And this is not what this is about. North American uh, the commentator Warren Wiersbe is called the, the pastor's pastor. He writes the following and he says, listen, these are not words to be repeated. Again, you know, with your, with your mind kind of numb, you're just repeating these words like the pagans were doing. This is not what Jesus is teaching. He is giving us a model to follow. And this morning we're looking at the first point of this model contained in the words, Our Father in Heaven. Now when we think about those four words, Initially, I thought, geez, Dave, how am I going to speak for 30 minutes on four words? But as you start going into it, there's so much there that I think you could have multiple sermons on, this, on these four words. Our Father in heaven. And so my job this morning is to help us just go back in time, as it were, and place ourselves among the crowds there on, on the, the Mount of, of uh, Beatitudes next to the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, and just place ourselves in the historical and cultural context of the day to truly understand what Jesus meant by saying, Our Father. 
our Father. What does it mean to be calling God our Father? We've got obviously our Western, you know, um, 21st century type of view of what that meant but I want us to go back in time just to see exactly what was meant what was implied when Jesus was teaching this when he was calling God our father does that make sense right so looking at that verse the first set of lenses I want to put on us this morning is, is looking at the, the words, Our Father, from the, from the perspective of Jesus himself. Uh, this whole prayer f- yeah, was, it flew, uh, that's not a word, is it? It, it came out of Jesus' life and ministry. It cannot be separated from him. So what he thinks about when he speaks about Our Father should be fundamentally where we start. And in John's Gospel, Jesus regularly uses the image of Father and Son to explain what he was busy with, to explain his career and his ministry and what he was doing. Like in John chapter 5, you would recall that Jesus said the following. He said, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does, also does. Numerous times, especially in the Gospel of of John, you see that, you know, Jesus would do something certain things and then he would say but the father is doing these things and therefore I'm doing it you know the father is working on the Sabbath therefore I'm working on the Sabbath and and after healing the person he's always looking toward the father and in that time and in that context this a son was always an apprentice of a father the son learned his trade from his father And when things got rough and problems came up, the son would always look to the father in terms of how to solve it. He would look at the father's response, and then he would go and he would mimic him. He would do the same. He would learn from his father. He was an apprentice. And in the same way, this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, whatever the father is doing, I'm trying to follow. I'm trying to follow. And even when things went haywire, you think about Gethsemane. The problems arose. What did Jesus do? He went to the Father. He was looking at the Father, saying, God, is this the way? Is this the cup I need to be taking? Is there no other way? Yet your will be done and not mine. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 5 said the following. It says that Jesus, the Son, learnt obedience by what? He suffered. In other words, even with Jesus, there was this learning of what it actually meant to call God Father in the sense of being an apprentice. And this learning all came to an end on the cross when he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And so for us, applying it to us now, when we come to God and we, we, we say these words, our Father in heaven, what this means is we're doing the same thing. We're saying, God, I am signing up as an apprentice. I'm signing up as an apprentice. It is saying, God, I want to I wanna see things the way you see things. I want to speak the words that you are speaking. I want to say them in the way that you are speaking. I want to feel what you are feeling. When you look at my life and the and the world around me, it's saying I want to become more like you in every sense of the word. Now the church has had many terms to kind of summarize what I've just said, something called godliness, Christ likeness, or to use the the imagery or the language of Genesis, it's it's being an image bearer of God. So when we say these words, it's from the perspective of Jesus, we're saying, God, I'm signing up. Put my name down as your apprentice. I want to become like you. Then again, thinking about the crowds just around Jesus on that, on that hill on that particular day, the majority of them being in Galilee would have been Jewish people. And when they heard the word Father, they also had connotations. They had some connections because of their past. And therefore, when they heard the words, it implied something a little bit different. Some people used to say, and you'll read this in certain, certain commentaries, although I think the, the majority of the consensus at the moment is, is that's not quite the case. And some, some would say that, that, that for Jesus to call God Father or Abba was something that was quite unique after, in the day. Um, and although he might have done it more than others, that's not quite the case. A lot of Jewish people that speak or think about God in that sense because of the Old Testament. In different times in their history where God interacted intervened and revealed himself as father. You'll find that in Isaiah, in the Psalms, and in Malachi in particular. But the first time this comes into play 
is in Exodus chapter 4. So God sends Moses, I'm sure you're familiar with the story. God sends Moses to, to Pharaoh, and this is right after the, uh, right before the last plague was about to happen. He, he sends Moses to Pharaoh, and he tells Moses to say the following to, to Pharaoh. He says, Thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Let my people go that they may serve me. And so for Israel to, to call God Father, it was always to, uh, in, in the sense of, 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 um, of holding on to hope that God would be their deliverer. Because in the first context that God revealed himself as Father, it gave them the assurance that God was about to act. God was about to bring, God was about, to bring about the exodus to deliver them from the tyrant and so when they when they heard about God as father that was the connection that they made this is the the one that's made the covenants this is the one that made the promises he is a faithful God he is going to come and liberate us and set us free from the grip of the tyrant and so in Jesus's day we just came out of, if you've been around the last uh, month or two, we just came out of the book of Lamentations. We read all about the first exile, what happened with the Babylonians. And at the end of that series, we said eventually ba Babylon was overthrown. More superpowers came into play. You had the, I think it was the Assyrians after the Babylonians. And then you had the Greeks, and then you had the Romans. And eventually, the Israelites were managed, they were able to go back to, to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. You can read all about that in Nehemiah and in Ezra. But ultimately, they were still, they were still under the power of these, of these foreign, foreign powers, these foreign nations, right? And so in Jesus' day, they were back in Jerusalem, but they were still under the power of Rome. And so when the Jews on that hill heard Jesus mention these words, Our Father in heaven, no doubt for them it would have meant, could it really be time? Could it really be time that God, our Father, our liberator, is going to act again? That the second exodus is going to happen, as he, as he foretold in the book of Isaiah? And so for them, they had this expectation um, in Second Temple Judaism that God was about to bring them out of exile, to get rid of all these powers that are over them. And by calling God Father, it invoked that particular tradition. And so for us, when we pray our Father in heaven, similarly, we are to think about God as the promise-keeping, covenant-keeping, faithful God. It's basically coming to God and saying, Father, I know that you are for us. You are fighting for us. You are acting for us. And although we might go through trials and tribulations, you are the one that is fighting for us. You're the one that will liberate us, that will break the power of the tyrant, whatever that looks like in your life, over our lives. Thirdly, there were some other maybe unwanted ears sitting on the hill that day listening to Jesus' sermons. And those were some Roman ears. And so, so no doubt, because of the gathering on this particular hill, wherever there were gatherings because of the past, what had happened with the Maccabees revolt and some other would-be messiahs that came about trying to bring about some sort of revolution, Rome had to squash that. And so wherever, wherever people came together in order to maintain the peace, no doubt, some Roman soldiers would have, would have listened to Jesus' words on this particular day. Now, in the Roman Empire, Caesar... The emperor was also known as father. And the reason this was forced upon the people is, is to show them that the reason we, they are thriving in life and the reason they have peace in the world was because of, of their father, Caesar. That Rome is the great benefactor of all things. All things good flow and all life come from Rome. And at the top of Rome, you've got Caesar. And so when these Roman soldiers would have heard the words of Jesus speaking about our Father, referring to Israel's God, they would have thought that this is treason. That what he is saying and what he is preaching is he is telling people to pledge allegiance to somebody else, somebody other than Caesar, whom they saw as, as Father. And so when we pray these words... In John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said the following. He sent out these disciples and he said to them, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so when we pray these words from that perspective, we are saying we are pledging allegiance to God. 
We are pledging allegiance to God. We're taking up the mantle, the vocation of being kingdom people in this world, according to John chapter 20. We're saying we will not, will not bow the knee to the powers of our day and the cultures of our day. We will not bow the knee to any other kingdom or throne apart from God. We are pledging our allegiance to you. And lastly this morning, now I want us to fast forward a few years. So Jesus crucified, Jesus resurrected, God sends the Holy Spirit. Uh, Matthew and the others pin all of this stuff down that had happened. John writes, finally writes his last gospel on those hills in Ephesus. And now I want us to look through their lenses. What does it mean to call God Father in the context now, post-resurrection, the context of the rest of the New Testament? When we read the New Testament, there are wonderful doctrines of salvation, right? So, so you'll, you'll learn all about election, like some complicated stuff, like election and predestination and regeneration and, and justification. Now, in regeneration means that God has made us alive, He's given us spiritual life. In justification, we are saying God has declared us to be in right standing with Him because of what Jesus has done. Now, one of these doctrines that the New Testament keeps bringing us back to is something called adoption. Adoption. And as the word implies and as we understand the word, what the New Testament teaches us is because of what Christ has done, we have become part of the family of God. John writes that in this, in this way, in his gospel in John chapter 1, he says, but to all who received him and who believed in his name, he, he gave power to become children of God. So in a way, what the New Testament is saying, and in the epistles as well, repeatedly, is that somehow we have become God's children in a real spiritual, a special sense. Members of his family. Paul writes it down like this, a little bit more lengthy, but I think it's worth a read. He says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. But for you, um, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit Himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are, uh, uh, that we are, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be also, also be glorified with Him. And so you see it in John, you see it in Paul, you can find it in the book of 1 John, that He speaks to us as Christians, as His children, His sons and His daughters. And even though the Old Testament might speak about Israel as the son of God, again in the Psalms and Isaiah and in Malachi, something else has happened here because of the work of Jesus, of the cross and the resurrection. Instead of God being external and saying, these people belong to me, God is now saying, these people belong to me. And the way that, they, that they'll know they belong to me is I'm going to put my seal upon them. I'm going to put my spirit inside of them. Wayne Grudem, again, just a... Uh, solid theologian from North America wrote the following, he said, but even though there was a consciousness of God as father to the people of Israel, the full benefits and privileges of membership in God's family and the full realization of that membership did not come until Christ came and the spirit of the Son of God was poured into our hearts, bearing witness with our spirits that we were God's children. Genevieve, can I ask you to come up, please? So to kind of wrap this all together, what does it mean to call God Father? As we come into prayer and we're saying, God, I wonder, we want to follow the model you've given to us, Jesus. What it is, is when we're saying, our oh, Father, we're saying, we are saying, sign me up as an apprentice. I want to be like you. I want to be like you in any sen every sense of the word. We say, our Father, it means that, God, we are trusting you as our Father to protect us, to liberate us, because you are for us, you're fighting for us. When we say, our Father, we are saying we are pledging our allegiance to you. We want to be a kingdom people, people who live into our vocation and our calling that you've given us to live into. And when we say, our Father, we are saying, we belong to you. You've put your spirit within us. You know us better than anyone else could know us. And yet you love us more than, anyone, more than anyone else could ever love us. 
And so this coming week, what again is fascinating about Jesus' life is, is often you'll read, he did this and this and this and, and taught and he healed and did all of this stuff. And then it says, and he slipped away. And he slipped away to go and pray and be with his father. Now you don't slip away to something you dislike, right? You don't slip away to something you dislike. And may you this week slip away to that secret place. Because in that secret place, you have the lover of your soul. You have your Father waiting for you. So we're going to move on now to a time of communion. Um, and so I'm going to invite you to come up um, as you are, so to come in and grab some of the elements. Um, and maybe this morning we'll do something, we'll do, I almost wanted to say we'll do things a little bit different, but I think nothing can top the differentness of what happened last week at Easter with the champagne and the cake. But what I want us to do this morning is to come and, and grab some of the elements. And you would have noticed that in that line, our Father, it's, it's, it's got a communal sense to it, right? And so the personal pronoun there is, is plural. It's our Father. It's, it's us together. And so what I want us together to do this morning is come up, get the elements, and then go back to your seat and, and with the people around you, whether it's with your family around you or, or whoever is, is around you, is think about the idea that we are part of God's family. We belong to Him. He's put His Spirit within us. He knows us better than anyone or anything else could ever know us, and yet He loves us. And so think about the idea of we are part of His family, and then just so one person out of that group, multiple could, but just have one person just pray and thank God for what he has done for us. Take the elements then and then I'll come up at the end after I, I can see everyone's cups are empty. I'll come up and I'll lead us in a prayer of, of, of signing up to be apprentices and a prayer of pledging our allegiance to God as we go into our week. So please come up and, and grab some of the elements.